as you know, um, I'm a medical director for Surf Lifesaving. I do a little bit of lifeguarding, and I'm an emergency doctor and work on the uh, Westpac helicopter a little bit. Um, that informs some of what I'm going to say. I've been an emergency doctor for 15 years here in New Zealand and then about five in California before that. If you have any questions, feel free to just interrupt and just raise your hand and, and, and speak up. I'm happy to take any and all questions. So the, the title of this is Myths and Realities, but really it's going to be a broad survey. Um, so look, these are some of the topics we're going to um, cover really quickly. I'll just get cranking on this. Um, if you look at water safety New Zealand stats, you'll see that in 2021, there were 74 fatal drownings. If you compare that to the number of road traffic deaths, it, it doesn't seem so big. But think about all the hours we spend in vehicles uh, versus actually in the water. And you realize that New Zealanders are at a disproportionate risk of dying um, in the water. Our rates of death in New Zealand are one and a half to two times higher than North American rates or European rates, about 1.3 times higher, I think, than Australian rates. Um, so it is a particular um, risk for us. The second uh, line there I, I found pretty shocking. So 84% of fatal drownings are males. Um, uh, among Modi, the rates are even higher, uh, the, the, the predilection for males drowning. And so um, we really need to target this group and reach them because we are currently not. Uh, Maori death rate twice as high per capita um, as the rest of New Zealand when it comes to uh, fatal drownings. This is just a graph that shows you male versus female breakdown. You can see it's just incredibly disproportionate there. Um, and this is uh, an age breakdown of young to old. Now what's interesting about this one for me is that this is a problem really of, of every age. Um, the, the older folks will be more involved in, uh, in boating accidents. The younger ones, the younger males especially, in in-water um, uh, swimming, snorkeling, gathering kai. Um, and we don't have a lot of the really young ones drowning because that's typically a uh, warmer climate swimming pool sort of thing. Um, and that's inverted from a lot of other countries, but relevant to our situation. Um, here we've got... Uh, just a map of, of last year's cases, and there really isn't any place that's spared. Um, our drownings are occurring uh, in rivers and harbors and on um, ocean beaches. Uh, what's behind these drownings? Uh, so a lot of it is overconfidence. It's uh, especially young male overconfidence in the water. We underestimate the risk of the ocean or the river. Um, we overestimate our own ability. And, um, and I think that's a problem that's actually been getting worse over time. Because as, as we get into, as our schools are getting into financial problems um, of not being able to maintain their school pools, we're losing access to pools nationwide. Um, and that's proceeding at a pretty amazing pace. We're creating a generation now of, of kids and youths who've had no um, teaching uh, on water safety, drowning prevention, um, and, and really, uh, uh, it's getting worse uh, year by year. That is something that, of course, is, um, is fixable if we have the political will. Um, the deaths occur uh, largely, well, almost exclusively outside of the patrolled areas. These aren't issues between the flags. These are issues where um, people are going uh, swimming um, where there aren't lifeguards handy. And one of the problems with that is when you rely on a largely volunteer uh, lifeguard or life-saving um, group, it, it has to be where they have a club, right? That's where most um, people are going to, uh, lifeguards are going to want to patrol. But that's not necessarily where the crowds are going. And that's not where we um, are addressing people. In, in an increasingly uh, warming um, uh, world, we're getting more and more issues of drownings along rivers and lakes. And so we need to figure out creative ways of getting people help and supervision to where they actually are, where they're recreating, where they're enjoying the water. Um, and then the last two here, falls while rock fishing, boats, and effective uh, life jacket laws. This is really the low-hanging fruit. Um, New Zealand does, in, in my opinion, a horrible job of ensuring people are protected when they're on or near the water with life jackets. And the result of that is lots and lots of preventable death. Um, 
we don't have any requirements that when you go rock fishing, you have a life jacket. And of course, life jackets are not as big and bulky as they once were. They're, they're getting cheaper and cheaper and better and better. They have auto-inflating ones that when you go in the water, um, they're, they're very low profile, very easy to wear, uh, comfortable, and they'll, they'll save your life. But we don't have any kind of mandate uh, to, to get that out uh, into the public. But other countries and states do. Um, and if you look at, uh, this, this was based off a study done in Tasmania. 2001, they pass a law that says um, when your boat is under power, so I, th I think that means sail or motor power, but when your boat is under power, you will wear a life jacket. It's mandatory, um, no exceptions. And they, uh, they looked at, at their drowning stats before the law was passed and their stats afterwards and found fatal drownings decreased by 67%. That's extraordinary. Um, if you talk to a lot of uh, paramedics or, or rescue swimmers, or the, the, um, the Westpac helicopter guys up there in that back corner, they'll tell you that they don't go to rescue um, people, uh, well, well, dead uh, patients, um, who are in life jackets. What, what you see are the ones who went in and either had cold shock or just became exhausted, drowned, and they may be picking them up. Well, obviously, they're picking them up when it's, when it's too late. A lot of these are body recoveries, right? That's what a lot of lifeguards end up doing. It's what a lot of um, all the rescue services end up doing. Th these folks who rescue people frequently are not rescuing dead bodies in life jackets, they're rescuing people who didn't have a life jacket on. So that's, that's low hanging fruit. This is a fixable problem. It's been fixed in Ireland. It's been addressed in Victoria, Tasmania, and those um, places have good numbers and good evidence that it works. Um, but I'll tell you what, what, what we do here. Um, Maritime New Zealand has a law that says you've got to have uh, one life jacket per um, person on the boat. This is for small boats in that five to six meter category. Um, but you don't have to be wearing it. Um, it can be under the seat, in the chili bin, in the cuddy of the boat. You have to have one on the boat. You're supposed to wear them during times of increased risk, like crossing bars. But what we know from reality is that people don't always foresee the risk, and a lot of people end up in the water rather suddenly off of boats and recreating and, and fishing on rocks. They don't see it coming. One slip, one moment, and they're in the water. And by, leaving, by making it volitional, by putting it on people to say, you need to, to do this yourself, um, uh, you know, off your own back, um, I think we miss a chance to prevent <coughs> probably on the order of 10 or 20 or 30 fatalities per year, which is extraordinary. If you think about the web of, of families that are affected by these 74 drownings a year, it's vast. These are people often in the prime of life with families, um, and they... Like their loss is quite destructive of, of society. So there is a way of addressing this. So that was the New Zealand uh, life jacket law. So different regional councils, so like Auckland will have its own slightly firmer rules about life jackets. And, and they'll say something like um, six meter or smaller boat, life jackets must be worn during times of increased risk like bar crossings. Um, everyone on board must wear their life jacket. And this, this is great. So, so far I'm like, yeah, this will save lives unless the skipper says it's safe not to, and then you don't have to. <laughs> so that's where we are with laws and requirements and mandates and rules. Um, we're, we're making it a personal problem as opposed to a systemic solution that could actually fix things. Um, and, and that's hopefully something we can change. It's why I was so keen to drive down here from Northland today, um, because I figure there's what? I don't know how many people here, 100 people-ish? Yeah, a few hundred online, that's at least 400 more people who understand uh, that there's a better way and that we can improve this. All right, now we're going to switch um, uh, tracks a little bit to what's already been covered here, this drowning definition, the process of experiencing respiratory impairment from submersion, going under, or immersion uh, in liquid. Only two outcomes, fatal or non-fatal. You can have with or without morbidity. But the point of this here is in the old days, we used to refer to drownings only when they had a fatal outcome. He drowned, that means he's dead. But we don't do that anymore. Um, doing that missed out a huge amount of morbidity. So in the, in, in the old days, uh, it ignored the people that end up in ED, hospitalized in ICU, or with permanent um, neurologic devastating injury uh, because they didn't drown. Uh, what we wanna do is call it what it is, it's a non-fatal drowning. 
and it's okay to say he drowned and survived. That this has been the medical definition uh, from the World Health Organization and International Life Saving Federation and others for 20 years, but it just hasn't percolated down to um, the media and common parlance. All right, now we talk about physiology, um, which I like a lot. Um, because I think if you understand kind of the processes that are going on in the human body, it gives you a much better understanding of, of what your response should be, what your actions can be. So uh, I'll talk about this, this slide first. So um, Feiner in the 1950s, he's a physiologist, and he goes to a dog pound, and he gets 153 mongrels, small ones, and he drowns them all. Um, and he, he is measuring their respiratory rate and blood pressure and things and publishes a paper. Now, it's horrible. It's gruesome. You can only imagine what these animals experienced. Um, but this has actually underpinned a lot of the physiologic work ever since because we obviously don't have good data on these catastrophic um, events with humans. But the, the point of this here that, that shocks me is, I guess first I'll give you the, the background of your average dog, something like a, a Labrador, um, has the cardiovascular reserve and the fitness of an Olympic athlete. Uh, they're on a different plane from us. So when you hear that a dog in a drowning event, uh, in, in a capsize, was found dead floating in the water, it tells you something about the severity of, of, of how, how, how bad this was. So these dogs, um, shockingly, is there a little pointer on this thing or not really? Maybe not. Well, we won't worry about it. Can you see that? That's fine. Within 70 seconds, on average, they had um, given up the ability to breathe. They essentially were in respiratory arrest. And for, for a dog that's you know, fitter than we will ever hope to be, that's pretty impressive. And it tells you there's some really weird things going on physiologically that incapacitate people who are drowning much faster than you'd think. So within 70 seconds, they've stopped breathing. You can see they had sort of uh, gasping uh, for breath and then essentially uh, apneas. Their blood pressure rose because they had the big, big adrenergic surge, just like we would. Um, but very quickly, 70 seconds, it starts dropping. Their cardiac output drops, and then it drops off to nothing. So this is at 130 seconds. On average, they've got no pulse, no blood pressure, uh, no, essentially no cardiac output. So these are, these are average numbers. Now, I want to talk about the human um, experience of drowning. Um, we know some of this from good physiologic studies on static apnea, so people who do breath hold dives and try to set records. Right? There are people who can um, free dive. Uh, and have trained themselves uh, and can do 11-minute uh, breath holds. Um, if they breathe oxygen for 30 minutes beforehand, they can do 25-minute breath holds. Um, if they dope themselves with beta blockers, get their heart rate down, that extends their, their downtime by about 20%. And all of that um, is a bit misleading because you say, I can hold my breath for several minutes. You know, why, why do people become incapacitated so quickly? Oxygen consumption is enormous in, in a drowning event. And what these um, apnea divers are, are professional at is calming themselves. They get their heart rate down to 20s and 30s. They drop their um, uh, myocardial oxygen demand, but just in, in general, their, um, their uh, metabolic needs drop to almost nothing. And they enter a trance-like state. And they can hold that um, for a really long time. That's not the normal human drowning uh, response. What you have in these these athletic dogs, right, more cardiovascular fit than, than we are, you have this insane oxygen demand that is stripping um, you of, of, um, of your oxygen stores. You've got a breath holding event that's going to decrease your cardiac output. So when you take a hyperinflated breath and, and you hold it in, in anticipation of going under, let's say, you decrease your cardiac output. Your lungs get very big. Your intrathoracic pressure um, is quite impressive. Uh, you initially Obviously, you're dropping your diaphragm to pull in more uh, blood into your heart. But that stops. Once you start valsalving, you don't really have a lot of ability to fill your heart. And very quickly, that can drop your cardiac output. Um, impaired venous return means a drop in cardiac output, means a drop in blood pressure faster than you would otherwise think. Another thing that happens is you get panicky, and your, um, your neurohumeral system goes wild. Right? So you're, you're flooded with adrenaline. Your sympathetic nervous system is, is releasing something like 20 uh, times, 20 to 30 times, 
the uh, amount of discharges it would normally be putting out. And that uh, means you're going to be hypertensive. Your vascular, your peripheral vascular resistance goes up. Um, you get a tachycardia. You have chronotropy and inotropy. But at the same time, once you aspirate the air, it's a huge vagal stimulus, right? A parasympathetic stimulus um, of airway, essentially, manipulation. Anyone who's dealt with airways knows you can Brady someone down pretty effectively, especially in this PEDS group. You would know that. And so you've got um, a combat between uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic that provokes a few things. It provokes apneas, and it provokes cardiac dysrhythmias. So you can get tachycardic. You can get bradycardic. You can have bradyacystolic arrests. You can have all kinds of ectopy, ventricular tachycardias, you name it, and none of, none of which uh, helps you um, during this time. So autonomic conflict. Eventually, you'll uh, break your breath hold. It may be within a few seconds. It may be a minute. When you do that, water is going to pretty quickly enter your stomach. Um, you may, uh, you'll, it'll also enter your airways. You might get a transient laryngospasm, which means if you're trying to stay alive and trying to get to the surface and breathe, you now have to deal with your vocal cords being clamped shut, sometimes to the point where you can lose consciousness, even if you weren't in water. So there's a lot of contrary things um, impeding your ability to, to stay alive. Water enters the stomach. Um, it enters the lungs. Uh, your lung surfactant gets washed out. So your, think about a balloon. You know how the first few breaths are the hardest to get a balloon inflated? Well, every one of your little alveolar air sacs is just like that as well. And if you put a little soap in there, you create a little bubble, it will hold its form. It'll hold its shape. It'll stay open better. And once you wash out that surfactant, that, that dish soap-like uh, liquid, you get a lot of atelectasis. You have um, alveolar sacs that are collapsing. And with big time lung collapse and atelectasis comes uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. You've got um, intrapulmonary shunts where good blood um, is being circulated to non-functioning lung. And um, that obviously is going to uh, lead to the sort of catastrophic cardiac output problems we're seeing there. Cerebral hypoxia kicks in. You lose the respiratory drive to breathe. You'll typically pass out in 30 to 90 seconds uh, into your drowning event. You may have some myoclonic jerking and seizures. Um, I'll show some videos of real drownings. Um, they're non-fatal. The, the patients survived and, and did OK without neurologic deficit. If you want to leave during that, because maybe you've had an unpleasant experience with it, I fully understand that. I'll just give you a warning before I show them. It's only like maybe four minutes worth of it. Uh, it's, it's in a pool um, and with cameras on. But um, you'll see how quickly these people lose consciousness um, and how some of them have myoclonic jerks. There's a respiratory arrest, which is that bit in the middle. And then later, there's a cardiac arrest. So from what we're trying to do as lifeguards is, is intervene at the point of respiratory arrest to reinstate ventilation, to get air and oxygen in, to, uh, to keep them alive, to keep the brain alive. If you leave them apneic for long enough, eventually the brain will be injured. At first, it'll be a reversible neurologic injury, and then it'll become permanent. And only far later, way down the line, maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes down the line, will you get standstill, cardiac standstill. You get asystole. So the heart's very resilient. It's sort of the last thing to go. Um, and so we need to intervene quite early, um, because intervening at that cardiac arrest point is typically late. The brain has typically been profoundly injured. All right. So that's. That's my little talk on physiology. So often you will be told or you will hear about people um, expecting drowning victims to call out and wave, hold an arm up for help. That's a swimmer in distress, right? That's someone who's, who's going to have swim failure soon, but not drowning. And what we're going to see in the videos is that most drowning is silent drowning. Someone slips below the surface. You didn't even know they were there. They're now at the bottom. You don't notice them. And they went out much faster than you would ever suspect. That's the reality of most drowning. Um, at the end, I'll just show you these videos. And, uh, and we'll talk through some of them. Quite interesting. All right, now we'll talk about a few little studies. Um, you'll often hear people, educated people, um, talk about you know, cold water. This, this person drowned in cold water. We brought him in. Um, you know, it should be all right. Realistically, the cases you always hear about where the little two-year-old fell in through a you know, Canadian uh, lake, un through ice, or the 
50 kilogram woman was skiing and fell through the snow and spent uh, an hour underwater and, and didn't die, like they were resuscitatable and came back with neurologically intact function. Those are needle in a haystack situations. They're, they're huge exceptions. And almost invariably, they're very small people who were immersed in, in ice water and whose body temperature cooled down so quickly that they actually became hypothermic before they had a cardiac arrest. And so it was like sort of cold cardioplegia, right? They were uh, optimally cooled and then put, put under. And that is not going to be a realistic outcome for uh, well, any of the drownings I've ever been involved with. And in New Zealand, it's just not likely to ever be um, something that you need to seriously think about or, or, or consider. This was Linda Kwan's study. She was in, in an equally, if not colder place, Pacific Northwest, Washington State, looked at 1,094 people, uh, drowned adults. And um, Washington State, if you know, it has the Alaska current. It's very cold. The water's um, unpleasantly frigid, uh, you know, zero to 12 degrees. And um, even in that scenario, they didn't find better outcomes with water temperature being colder. Even in that scenario, they found that estimated duration of submersion was the best predictor of, income, of outcome. So what matters is how long you're hypoxic and underwater. Um, that's what really counts. And um, we know that if it's less than six or eight minutes, you'll have almost uniformly good outcomes. And if it's longer than that, it will approach uh, zero and beyond 25, 30 minutes, you're in the neighborhood of futility. Can you ever predict the one in a million that will survive? No, but we have to base medicine on something that's predictable and sustainable, and we have resource stewardship issues to, to deal with. And so I think knowing that estimated time of submersion is a pretty important criterion. This is a Dutch study. Um, they looked at 160 kids in cardiac arrest, uh, most of them longer than 30 minutes. So this is like the worst of the worst. 89% died. All of the survivors had severe neurologic disability. 12 of them went on ECMO. This is a few years ago, 2015 publication. Of the 12, 11 dead, one persistent vegetative state. I'm sure ECMO has gotten much better uh, since then, but it's, it's something to, to think about that these very long cardiac arrests um, typically do not end well. Uh, Swiss uh, PEDS outcome study, 80 uh, drowned kids, most of them quite young. Um, again, a cold place. You'd think if, if anyone was going to do great, it would be them. But realistically, we see time of immersion is the thing that matters. Less than five minutes, 94% good outcome. Greater than five minutes, 75% poor outcome. And I've listed in order the things that, that mattered, in order of uh, statistical like a significance. Um, Coma, high lactate, uh, low pH, um, hypothermia, hyperglycemia, all being significantly associated with a bad outcome. It's kind of uh, pretty, uh, pretty understandable. Um, all right, so now let's get into the, the myths that I said I would talk about. So these are the terms that we don't want you to use that people like Jonathan Weber will go nuts if you use. These are the, the terms that are so erroneous and misleading uh, that they've, they've actually harmed more people than they've ever helped. So secondary drowning or delayed drowning, you'll see these Women's Day stories, these Facebook posts. Every summer we get this, right? You've seen this. All of you have seen this. My son was splashing in the pool or playing in the waves, my little six-year-old boy. He coughed up a little bit of water, but he was fine. Um, he went home. Everything was great. Three days later, he was blue around the lips to Kipnik frothing within half an hour. We brought him to ED, they intubated him. He was put in an ICU and he was dead 24 hours later. This is like a typical summer story. I think the media um, is on the, the, the outlook for it. And inevitably, the parent goes back and searches their memory banks and says, oh, it had to have been that, that we went to the pool three days ago and that was it. And in, a, in no case has it ever been substantiated as a post-drowning issue, a secondary drowning or delayed drowning. There's no such thing. When, in the few cases where they followed it up properly and we've got autopsies and whatnot, more often than not, they'll find um, uh, myocarditis uh, to be the, the, the cause of the uh, acute pulmonary edema, CHF, respiratory failure, arrest, and death. And that has nothing to do with the drowning event. The child probably got a viral um, myocarditis and uh, succumbed to that. So we don't talk about delayed drowning or secondary drowning because if you're going to have a bad outcome with drowning, you're gonna be symptomatic from the time. 
It's you're not going to go home with a perfectly fine kid and then uh, wake up 12 hours later and, and find them unconscious. They're going to be symptomatic, tachypnic, coughing, spluttering, something. There'll be symptoms. So people who are symptomatic after their drowning event, you want them to get checked out in hospital. So lifeguards, uh, St. John, whomever, you want them to get into hospital. Uh, we're going to check SATs. We may do x-rays. We may do a period of observation and, and, and more things. Dry drowning is an interesting bit of uh, jargon. It can sometimes be misused with the other two, and sometimes it can refer to dry lungs. Uh, in the old days, they would autopsy drowned patients and find that a decent number of them had dry lungs. They would open up the chest and find no pulmonary edema, no water uh, in the lungs. And they said, oh, I guess these people died because, they, uh, because of uh, some other um, vascular issues or what have you, but not directly from water in the lungs. But now we know with better um, high resolution CTs, better um, computer uh, software to go along with that, almost all of, virtually all of our, our drowned patients will have water uh, entry into the lungs. And what you can actually have, the reason these pathologists were finding dry lungs afterwards, they thought maybe there was laryngospasm that, of course, laryngospasm doesn't, doesn't work after you die. So it's a transient thing while you're still alive. Right, it relaxes upon death. What was happening? Probably post-mortem um, shifts across the cellular membranes. Um, after you die, there can be, uh, it depends on the t tonicity of the water, um, shifts across into your interstitium. And so you can have lungs that get more or less wet post-mortem. Um, quick mention of cold water drowning and prognostication. I think we already covered that enough. What matters is time underwater. It's duration of submersion. And then this is a big one. It's, it's I don't know, we'll call it a pet peeve, but it's, it's a concern that all of you need to be aware of. You need to be advocates for your patients on this one. There's a push with primary cardiac arrest to do um, hands-on, right? A push hard, push fast. Don't delay. Don't stop. Don't waste time for breaths. Just get on there. And that makes a lot of sense in the vast majority of cardiac arrests. So if someone like me has a, a collapse, you need to circulate the oxygenated blood around so that someone can go run and get an AED and restart my heart. But in drowning, you've used up the oxygen on your, uh, in your red blood cells. All the hemoglobin is, is uh, deoxygenated. And circulating dead blood around, deoxygenated blood, doesn't make a ton of sense uh, physiologically um, nor practically. We also used to think that doing chest compressions would circulate some air around, that you would get some ventilation going on. But in more and more studies now, it's looking like all you do with your chest compressions is really just move a column of maybe 50 mils of air of dead space up and down, up and down with each compression. Because you have to remember the, the, the alveolar air sacs are patchless. They don't have shape. Um, and if you're not putting air in, their natural tendency is towards atelectasis. You're compressing the chest. The, the drowning process is, is injuring the lung. It's going to get less and less aerated as time goes on. And nothing short of positive pressure ventilation, which is going to be mouth to mouth or a bag valve mask, is going to reinflate those lungs. So it's just something to think about that hands only CPR absolutely has its role. You know, a lot of patients in the community don't want to do mouth to mouth. Uh, absolutely, for the primary cardiac arrest, it, it is the thing to do. But in many other scenarios, I'm sure some pediatricians would, would agree with this because they have a lot of respiratory arrests leading to cardiac arrest. Um, the resumption of ventilation is critically important um, to, to the point where we want lifeguards to begin ventilating as, as soon as they can. Um, if you can successfully get a person uh, in that vulnerable state where they have a respiratory arrest but not yet a cardiac arrest, that's exactly when they've got salvageability rates in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. That's when you need to be getting to them. Let's see, what have I... Missed. I've talked fast and I've talked a lot, and I hope that was most of what I, yeah, I think that's most of what I wanted to say. AED use versus ventilation. Um, if you watch Bondi Rescue, they'll run, say, run, get the AED, and there's always a big scene about getting the AED. Keep in mind, in real life, less than 10%, roughly, uh, of patients who drown will have a shockable rhythm. Um, again, the natural tendency is to go towards bradyacystolic arrest. It's unlikely you're going to get a pulses VTAC or uh, ventricular fibrillation that you can shock back. It can sometimes happen. Obviously, get the AED. But don't pretend that that is the most important intervention. You need to resume 
ventilation. Okay. I know we've gone way over time overall, but um, that's most of what I wanted to say. This is a nice drowning chain of survival. Really, the first ring should probably be 100 times bigger than all the others because the prevention is what matters, um, recognizing distress, throwing them flotation, and if you go in yourself, having some flotation, a chili bin lid, um, cushions that float, something that will help you effect the rescue because it's a lot harder than you think, and very frequently there's uh, one patient becomes two fatalities uh, when the rescuer drowns as well. And then most of us are at the last and frankly least important stage with the, probably the least impact um, in terms of numbers of lives saved, um, but still important, still part of the process. So that's the whole of my talk. Um, I can put on some videos if people are interested. Gabrielle, one of the things you asked about was antibiotics. And I think it's hard to make an antibiotic recommendation. Um, is it it's good to go? Yeah, what do you want to say, I, like, from, you can start it and then just pause it. Cool, cool. Yeah. Hard to say, like what, what prophylactic antibiotic would you give? Is this uh, enterobacter? Is it a gram negative? Is it uh, uh, strep pneumonia? Is it aeromonas? Um, is it Vibrio from seawater, uh, which is pen, penicillin insensitive? So it's like, it, it, we, it would be hard to even know where to start. Um, how do you know it's not a chemical pneumonitis from an aspiration from stomach contents? There's a whole list of things it could be, and, and probably it's worth waiting a little while until you're quite confident this is a bacterial pneumonia. The Dead Sea thing you mentioned was absolutely fascinating. So in the Dead Sea, people don't tend to drown because they cannot submerge. They can't sink low enough to drown because it's obviously highly buoyant in the Dead Sea, really hypertonic. But they do end up aspirating, sorry, uh, ingesting, swallowing a lot of extremely salty water. And the other group that gets incredible hypernatremia are people who've had really prolonged um, survival sessions where they've been in a life jacket, getting water splashed at them for so many hours, end up swallowing a ton of it. Of course, it gets rapidly absorbed, um, and that sodium goes into the systemic circulation, and you end up with impressive um, hypernatremia. The treatment, like most things for us, is going to be supportive right? and, and gradual um, uh, uh, fixing of the, the uh, electrolyte abnormality. Um, those little questions. Yeah, yeah. Just a few little stories about um, this particular scenario that might be of interest. Um, things that make it hard is in a small community when you have a grandfather that's a stalwart of the community who was heavily involved in the Coast Guard, the same Coast Guard that's coming to rescue them. A family that's heavily involved in surf life-saving the same lifeguards that are coming to rescue them. Um, I can't imagine uh, the things it does. It affects just such a big circle and web of people. Um, and then just another thing I don't know that got mentioned is the hazards and rescue of a flip boat that's on a bar. It's on a sandbank. Well, I think it said somewhere like 50 meters from shore. It's, it's in really shallow water. And the, the first question I had is, did any lifeguard or rescue swimmer try to go under the boat, because you know they said the grandfather's still under there, the dog's under there, maybe a kid's under there. Did anyone, were they tempted to swim under this boat that's in crashing waves on a bar where they're gonna get crushed to death? And that was my sort of like second question was, did anyone actually go under? Because that's a recipe for the rescuer dying. And uh, it's cool to hear that, that um, like uh, Westpac, uh, those guys in the corner there have a good policy of not putting themselves into deathly situations like that, where there's a high likelihood they'll be crushed um, and not going into closed spaces that they can't have egress from. And couldn't, because you get that suction, right? When something's on a, on a solid surface, you can't get it out, which is why they had to pull the Coast Guard folks over with a boat and lots of people to flip it over, and that's why you had that prolonged downtime of all of these patients survived without neurologic uh, injury. This is publicly available stuff. Poseidon is an underwater drowning system that's marketed for pools. It's just some cameras underwater and a computer that figure out, figures out if it, a, a person-like thing is sitting at the bottom for too long, and it alerts the lifeguards. You may have seen this. It's, it's, it's on YouTube. Um, try to spot who the victim is, and then count in your mind how many seconds it, it takes for them to become immobile. It's quite surprising. And so this is going like, you know, the whole day it's on. It's just filming. Um, 
So there's not going to be calling for help and an arm up. It's going to be a, a bit of distress at the surface, a bit of fighting for survival, and then a sinking to the bottom, and a pretty rapid incapacitation. You see a few movements, a few purposeful movements. You'll see people blissfully unaware of what's going on. The uh, machine is now um, alarming. It takes about 15 seconds more for someone to get in there and rescue this little girl. But that's what drowning looks like. Very unimpressive. And, and if this happens in the sea, you're not going to see it. And you, um, yeah, you might respond kind of late. And if we say we talked about six minutes of, of the brain you know, doing well, that's not a lot of time. All right, so they've caught her at a time of respiratory arrest, but probably before neurologic injury, probably, well, almost definitely before cardiac arrest. Uh, the next one, please. Um, all right. uh, somewhere in the midfield, you'll see a boy that's now gone out on this slope. Every one of us has had the situation where you lose the ability to touch. This sort of thing happens every couple of years at Kaiwi Lakes where there's a very steep drop off. You see that boy on the left? He now cannot touch, he's in distress. Um, he's sort of up and down. He pushes off again. Don't know if he ever makes it to the surface on that one. And you can see incapacitation uh, happens a lot faster than you might think. Looks like this man's rescuing him. No, people are oblivious. <laughs> people are oblivious. You don't know who's playing. You can't see well when you're underwater without goggles. And there, the machine registers someone on the bottom and, and someone jumps in and rescues him. Are they right. watching cameras? Sorry? Are they watching cameras? There's a computer watching the camera and it alarms in the whole place and you know. Uh, I think they would either look at a screen or they, that's when you'd start scanning pretty quickly if you're a lifeguard and you hear the klaxon going off. All right, um, and the last one, please. Uh, 6.43. Yeah, this is like quite old now. There's, there's more advanced, sorry, what was it? 6.43. 6.43, yeah, it is amazing technology. So this is interesting. I'm just gonna pause that there because this is an interest of mine here. Um, is that not pausing? Oh, okay. All right. Sorry about that. Can you take it back to whatever we had said, 6.53? Yeah. So how many of you have heard of shallow water blackout? No? Like one or two? A few? A handful? Interesting concept. You uh, hyperventilate often uh, so you can stay under longer, which is ill-advised. You try to swim underwater, and you have, you have two issues going on, right? You have an oxygen level that's dropping. You have a CO2 level that's rising. And... The CO2 level is what prompts you to breathe. If you were to try to hold your breath now, you get a couple minutes into it, you'll feel like a tearing sensation. You just have to breathe. That's the CO2 getting high. But you can train yourself to ignore that like the pros do. Um, you can also hyperventilate for a long time. Again, not advised. It's a good way of dying. Um, you can blow down that CO2 till it's non-existent in your blood. And that gives you a long time un underwater for it to rise slowly, the CO2, as you swim or spearfish or whatever. The problem only comes when you're so good at hyperventilating that you've blown off your CO2. It's rising, but it never gets to this threshold that tells you you have to breathe. It's rising, you're sweet. You're getting that, that last scallop. Meanwhile, though, your oxygen level is dropping to below the threshold that you need to maintain consciousness with, and it's lights out in a second. This stuff is like on-off switch. Uh, if we thought drowning was bad with all the intrapulmonary shunts, this is like instantaneous lights out and you go to sleep, you go unconscious, um, and you, you die. Uh, anyone who spearfishes knows someone who has blacked out in a pool. Um, I have a colleague whose son died and it's suspected from this. It's not very hard for this to happen if you're trying to go after craze or, or scallops or spearfishing to hyperventilate and to black out. And hence the idea of, of always going out with a buddy and not hyperventilating. What was that? 
Right. People, so this is what this young man is trying to do. And it's, it seems to almost always be young men. This is like the thing of the, the 25-year-old male. So he's trying to do lengths. And, and if you watch the video, he does go back and forth a few times. And then it's just bing, shallow water blackout. And this is something that you know, most people haven't heard of. You've all heard of spearfishing and breath hold. And some of, some of you have heard of apnea. But we don't talk about this stuff. And we've got lots of young men, especially Maori men, going out to gather uh, in the ocean food. And this can happen to them. And, and we're not really doing a great job of informing people <coughs> about this. This can obviously be avoided by uh, paying attention to not hyperventilating. And of course, people hyperventilate because it like doubles their time underwater. So it's a high risk thing. So here he's doing his laps. He blacks out. Bink, done. And that's about it. There's some like, you'll get some jerking. Um, and you can have good videos of static apnea people um, spazzing out and, and, and seizing essentially in the water. But it's a very quick thing. And if you don't have someone there to rescue you, you will remain asleep underwater. Um, that's everything I possibly wanted to tell you about drowning. I hope you found it interesting. Um, and I'm sorry it uh, took that long. But thanks for having me.